You know, in light of my wife and her birthday this week, I saw this and thought it fit. My husband went to buy a birthday gift for his wife. Some friends had been invited over that night to, to celebrate her big day, and he wanted to get something special. At the store, he spotted some cute little music boxes, and one blue one was playing Happy Birthday. Thinking they were all the same, he chose a red one and had it gift wrapped. Later at dinner, all the friends were there, and he gives it to his wife, and he asked her to open it, and when she lifted the lid, they started playing a song. The old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be. I didn't do that. We begin today in verse 12 of chapter 15, sermon I've called No Greater Love. We're going to uh, cover several verses this morning, but... I'm going to do like a like a roaming commentary as we go through, so it won't take as long. But uh, we have to remember that, you know, we stopped last time in verse 11, and Jesus didn't stop talking in verse 11. This is a continuation of what he was telling his disciples. We talked last time about the, the I am the vine, you are the branches. And so this is a continuation of what he was saying. He didn't say, he didn't just stop and say, new topic. This is, you know, sometimes we get caught up in the chapter verse thing, but Jesus is just talking. He didn't have chapter verse. Okay? So, we're going to start off verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid out his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. These things I command you, that you will love one another. No greater love. Let's all pray. Fathers, we get into your word today. Father, let it be your words and not mine. Let us hear from you. Father, let your words go deep into our heart. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, he said a new commandment. What is this new commandment? Well, I've talked about the commandments of Christ and love, right? Love is the main commandment that Jesus always told us about. He tells us about love all the time. It's the same love Jesus had for his disciples that Jesus required of his disciples, okay? He wants them to love. <coughs> He said that you love one another as I have loved you. How did he love them? How does he love us? Well, he gave us all, right? He gave us all. Obedience to Jesus by those he calls his friends is expected. It is expected. But, but you know, they were not the authors or the initiators of this discipleship to Jesus. He called them. He chose them. They did not choose him. He both chose and appointed them or set them apart for a purpose. It's absolutely critical whenever we discuss the subject of election to realize it is, it's not about privilege, but it's about purpose. So here, the choosing or the appoint the appointing of the disciples is not merely some privilege of being selected to an elite group, but it's for a specific purpose, and that purpose is bearing fruit. It is bearing fruit. Jesus wants them, he wants us to bear spiritual fruit. You know, when people talk about 
election. Some people get all caught up in the fact that, well, you're elected to go to heaven or go to hell. You're elected to be saved. You're chosen to be saved. Well, that means that if some are chosen to be saved, then Jesus chose some not to be. And that doesn't line up with, with his word. For the word says he's not willing that any should go to hell. Any should perish. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever. So, when people start talking about election, being chosen by God to be saved, they get a little bit confused. They were not chosen to be saved. They were chosen to bear fruit and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to the unsaved. That's what we're chosen to do. Let me tell you, every saved person is chosen to bear fruit and spread the gospel. When we ask Jesus into our heart, we are chosen from that second to bear fruit, to spread the gospel. Are we elected? Yeah, as soon as we're saved. It says that, that whatever you ask in the Father's name, well, this, this, this text returns to the subject of prayer as it did in verse 7. It's talking about prayer here. You know, people get all caught up in, well, I can ask whatever I want to. Want me a big old four-wheel drive truck, you know. Well, come on now, really? Let's, let's kind of dive into this for just a minute. Prayer in Jesus' name is not simply just using the name of Jesus to get what we want. It's about abiding or staying, remaining in Jesus, the vine, and praying his name implies that 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 we become aligned with the spirit and the nature of Jesus so that requesting something out of line or out of the nature of Jesus would be completely excluded from consideration. He, 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 he will answer our prayers. He gives us the desires of our heart. But let me tell you, when we're in tune with him, he gives us the desires. It's not some off the wall something or another. Okay? He supplies the desires. Why? Because we're in tune with Him and His Word. Let me, let me give you a little side note here. God will never tell us to do something or give us a privilege to do something that does not line up with His Word. He cannot contradict His Word. You probably know somebody who's gone back on their Word. God never has. Jesus never has. Never gone back on his word. Authentic discipleship is it's encapsulated by love for each other. It is, it is all about love. Jesus died for these frail human beings. Me. You. Why? Love. Love. This model of self-sacrifice is recognized by, by those whom Jesus called his friends. He said, I don't call you slaves. I don't call you servants. I, don't, I call you friends. I call you friends. Their obedience was not a result of some sort of Slavery. Their obedience is all based in love. They are his friends. They have learned from Jesus about the will of God. This knowledge, it, it, it did not result from their own capabilities. It comes from God. It was given to them because they were chosen and appointed to bear <laughs> fruit, spread the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ to others. That was their mission. That is our mission. When we, when we walk out that door, we are entering the mission field. That is the mission field outside our door. That is our job. That is our job. Jesus wants us to be a living community. You know what living means? active. Living does not simply mean breathing.
breathing. A person laying there on life support, their body may be breathing because of a machine, but it doesn't mean they're living. They can be brain dead and be laying there breathing with the help of a, of a, of a machine. So living doesn't simply mean breathing. When we live, we are active. We are doing. And if we're living for Jesus and living in Jesus and through Jesus, we're actively doing what? Bearing fruit, spreading his word. That can be done so many different ways. But when we base it out of love, nobody has to ask us what it's about. Because they all recognize love. And everybody's short on love these days. You know, the world doesn't easily accept a community with this kind of commitment. <coughs> and this next section deals with that. Verse 18 through 25. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things... They will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my fa father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. The Christian community in this day and time had already been excluded from the synagogues and they had suffered martyrdom throughout the Roman Empire. So for them to read these words, it struck a painful chord of realism. They're like, oh yeah, you got that right. Right? They read this later, and they were just like, the early church had just been excluded. I mean, Christians were being drug out and murdered. They were also reminded that their resurrected <coughs> Lord had also walked in the way of being hated. You know, we think about Jesus, sometimes it's hard for us to get this picture of how hated he was. He was so hated by his opponents, and his opponents were the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, those in the synagogue, those in the temple, hated Jesus. They didn't know how to deal with him. They couldn't handle this guy. They hated him. That's why he was murdered on the cross. So they thought, he was hung on the cross to fulfill prophecy for our sin. They thought they were fulfilling their own desires, their own hatred. They didn't know they were fulfilling God's word. Yes. Man, they hated Jesus. When it says before you in this text, it's reminding us that before they hated us, they hated him. They hate Christians because of Christ. Right? A Christian is a little Christ, remember? Should we as Christians expect any better than what Christ received? Christians all over the world are being persecuted and murdered because of Jesus today. There are countries right now that are they're, they're led by Islamic rule and they are murdering Christians doing whatever they want to do to them. And the government's just going, nah. They're unimportant because they're infidels. <clears throat> because they are infidels. What about here? What about here in the United States? You know, we think we're protected. But 
But right now, there's an all-out push to remove anything and everything Christian. Just watch the news. From removing crosses, we think it's no big deal, but that's, that's a starting point. Well, this cross offends me. Well, removing the cross offends me. Does that count? No, it doesn't. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Right? So, anything from removing crosses, cro crosses to pushing garbage in our kids' throats at school. I mean, this is anything they can do that goes totally against God's word, they're doing it right now. We must take a stand as believers. Our nation is becoming more and more ungodly every day. And, and one of the worst things we could ever say is, well, God's word said it would happen like this, and then do nothing about it. Yeah, his word does. Does that mean we have to stand by and let our kids suffer for it? No, Christians must take a stand. I remember when prayer was taken out of schools. Madeline Murray O'Hare threw a big old fit. And the Christians, the churches, sat back and said, It'll never happen. It will never happen. What? What? You, you took prayer to schools? Starting point. Starting point. Because one evil woman threw a fit. By the way, her son later, he got saved and said his mother was wacky. He said she was told him wrong. He didn't change anything. We have things coming against us in our United States today like this woke thing. Most of us are like, woke? What are you talking about woke? That's not even good grammar. Well, Woke removes everything godly it can. Anything about God it wants to remove. It wants to remove. There are those in power who want to make it illegal for you to even talk about Jesus. What do you think was behind the whole shut the churches down thing during the pandemic? Locally they asked us to. They didn't tell us we had to. Parts of the country they demanded. They said, oh, we're making law, which they never did. But they told them they did, so they shut down the churches for your own health and safety. While they let the BLM gather in the thousands for protest, they were saying, can the coronavirus spread there? But churches couldn't gather. They couldn't meet. Not even sitting in their cars in the park parking lot, listening on the radio while they were seeing the pastor up there. They were getting... Tickets are being arrested for sitting in their cars with windows up. What do you think is behind all that? Let me tell you something. Religious persecution is here. I thank God I live in Texas where Greg Abbott is our gov where is our gov is our gov governor, and he just signed it. We're saying no churches can be shut down by local governments again. And now the legislation is going to have brought it where we can vote on that November 2nd, I believe it is, and make it a permanent law. <clears throat> I thank God for that. I thank God for that. And then we have this critical race theory. You know, they keep bringing stuff up. I'm like, what are they talking yeah. about? CRT, critical race theory. They want it taught in our schools. What is, what's, what's the basic part of CRT? If you're white, it's your fault. Everything. If you're white, everything's your fault. Slavery, because you had slaves. How many of you have had slaves? I never have. Right? But if you're white, everything's your fault. Everything will be your fault, no matter what it is. That's the basic of CRT. Let me tell you, these things are ungodly. And we need to stand up going, uh uh. These things are coming to our school or our community, it stays away. Why? Because they go totally against God. <coughs> they want to talk about white privilege. Let me tell you about my white privilege. I was in the cotton field at five years old, holding cotton. Actually, holding the weeds in the cotton. I never understood when they call it chopping cotton. If you did that, you got in trouble. I was in the field at five years old, holding my hand. Right? I was working on the farm. I was mowing yards for five bucks a yard. 
but I was making money. You know, I was self-employed. My kids grew up working. I trimmed trees. They were dragging limbs as kids. They had white privilege also. A lot of you sitting here, you went to work at a young age. My wife and I worked all of our life. We have a choice. Let me tell you something. There was a day when I really think adults had kids to create more workers. That's why there's five of us. You know. <coughs> privilege. We have a privilege that we can read God's word every day. It's right here. The Bible says to hide it in your hearts. What does that mean? That means to read it, to learn it, have it in your heart. There may come a day when this book is illegal. The only Bible you have is what you learned. There are parts of the world today where they're not allowed to have this. Where if a underground church gets one Bible, they cut it up. Each person gets a page or a few pages. And they read it and they learn it and they trade pages around so they can all share the word and learn it. That's fact. When those underground churches are found, they are destroyed. Totally. Let's continue. talk about the Holy, Holy Spirit. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the, fa fa from, 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 from the Father. Holy Spirit is part of God, okay? The Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. You also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think they are offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when this when their hour comes, you may remember that I have told you. Jesus goes from the hatred of the world to his concern for his disciples and supplying the Holy Spirit. Remember, after Jesus died on the cross and after he rose again, after he was on, after he walked the earth for uh, 30 days, I believe it was, and then he ascended, and they were in the upper room, the Holy Spirit fell as Jesus said it would. And the Holy Spirit is our helper. After the Holy Spirit fell in it, fell on them, they began remembering all these things Jesus taught them. As he said they would. Okay? Now, Jesus said here that uh, whoever kills you will think they're offering service to God. Let me tell you, when people of other religions are killing Christians, they believe they are doing service to God. They are their God, but not the God. Okay? They believe they're doing service for God. They're killing these infidels. That's you if you're a believer. You're an infidel. When they're killing these infidels, they're doing service for God. They're doing something great. They're wrong. They are wrong. Many Christians have great anxiety and just like to read over these texts and pretend like they don't exist. But it's absolutely imperative for contemporary disciples to remember the goal of Jesus in the New Testament writers was not to divine, was, it was not divine condemnation. These texts are, are intended to be a warning. As Paul says, for our benefit to prevent us from falling away. But within almost every warning context, there is either a statement of assurance or an encouragement for Christians to succeed in faithfulness. A 
basic reason for Jesus having given this warning is spelled out in verse 2. Persecution is a major threat to the Christian community. We often think that, that our well-being or our prosperity are regarded as a mark of our obedience to God. And it's like a divine approval. But that would be incorrect. That's not the perspective of Jesus who wrote in this gospel he said the hour his hour or his death was appro approaching he's just hours away from his death at this point. Literally hours away. He would be tortured and hung on the cross. He is telling his disciples a warning. Every disciple was murdered one way or the other, except for John, who wrote this. John died of old age, but before he died of old age, he had been tortured. He had actually been boiled alive and survived. Boiled alive. He died of old age. Who knows what all was wrong with him after being tortured and boiled alive? He died of old age. He was the only one. The rest of them were martyred. They were all killed. And the persecutors actually thought they were serving God by seeking out what they considered to be the Christian error. They're all wrong. They can't be right. This is what I've been told my life. This can't be anything new and great. So we must end it. But the more they tried to end it, the more the word spread. Yeah. It started with Stephen, a deacon in the church. They drug him aside because he was a strong believer. And stoned him, which means they had a little pit and they had big rocks and they were hitting him with him until he, until he died. But they did this after he preached a sermon to him. And while they're killing him, he is smiling at them. What a guy. It's also the first time we see Paul, who was named Saul at that time. He was holding their coats, approving. He'd been given letters from the religious leaders to go seek out Christians to have them killed. So he's like, there's the first one. Later on the road to Damascus, he was knocked off his his ride, his donkey where he was riding, and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's like, who are you? He says, I am Jesus. Had to come as a starting re revelation, though. No. Wait, you're dead. I heard you rose again, but you're dead. No. And Saul got saved, letter to God, changed the name from Saul to Paul. Saul's his Hebrew name. He was a Roman citizen. So Paul was his Roman name, so Saul is one killing all the Christians, so God said, you just start using the name Paul. And Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Persecution is a real thing. Paul was persecuted his entire life until he was killed. His entire Christian life. Imitation this morning. Jesus said there's no greater love than for someone to lay down their life for their friends. And then he told them, I am your friend. He laid, he laid down his life for us also. In John chapter 10, verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's us. And then in Romans 5, 7 and 8, he said, it says, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, not righteous, nor good, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what that means? We don't have to wait till we get to be a good person to get saved. We don't have to wait till we're somehow righteous to get saved. 
while we were still sinners, dying in our sin, while we were still <sighs> nasty. Sin makes us dirty. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for me when I was a rotten sinner. He died for you. <coughs> Maybe you're sitting there going, well, I've been saved for a long time. We all need to be reminded. Why? So we can bear fruit and spread the gospel. He didn't die just for you and me. He died for everyone. It's our job to bear fruit. It's our job to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we doing that? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that, that we can come to you and we can bear much fruit and we can spread the gospel. It is not illegal for us. Father, we can still do, do this. And I thank you that we can. Father, may we have the wisdom to know when and who and the courage to do it. Show us. Ignite that fire within us. Remind us of how much we are loved. And in Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand. Invitation this morning. We're going to have the altar open. And what do you need this morning? What do you need? If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you need to be forgiven. You need Christ in your heart. Maybe you need a fresh fire. Maybe you need prayer this morning. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, today is that day. As we sing... Ask God what He wants you to do. And don't wait. Let's take care of that now.